Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is a series on the least of these, ministering to those in need. This particular lesson is lesson number five in that series, entitled The Cry of the Prophets. This is the lesson for August 3 of 2019. We'd like to ask you to join us in prayer as we begin. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the guidance you've given us in Scripture, and especially for these challenging ideas that we need to think about and give serious attention to about how we can reach out to those around us. Guide us in our discussion is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We have been looking at Old Testament prophets. We're going to focus on them more. We the, some the, the one the minor prophets, the ones that, and some major prophets too. We talked about Psalms and Proverbs, and now we're going to try to dig a little bit deeper into the some of the other Old Testament prophets. We'll look at specifically at Amos, Micah, Ezekiel, and Isaiah. They spoke out boldly, as you probably know, if you've done the much studying of scriptures against the kings, against the rich sometimes, and those who ex- exercise power over others. They were struck with grief, anger, and outrage. Sometimes they even acted out their messages. They could not be ignored. So how would you compare Ellen White's role in our church with the roles of these Old Testament prophets? How would it make you feel to have someone in your church that was receiving documented instructions and reproofs from God, especially if they were directed at you and pointed out your sins? Ever thought about that? Well, she wrote them to the people whose sins she was correcting. Yes. So we could kind of open our books and read through there and and see the yeah <laughs> what applies to us. Yeah. Same same kind of things as we do with the Bible. You know, the warnings to them yeah. apply to us as well. And anyone who's looked through the Old Testament knows that the children of Israel did a pretty I don't know what I should call it, a faithless or pretty lousy job of following God's instructions. Starting from Deuteronomy on, things deteriorated. And so what did God do? He appointed prophets. He spoke to those prophets and he said, take this message and give it to whoever needs to get that message. And it started with Moses and on it went. And these prophets kept calling people to come back to God. They had wandered away. So what did they wander away to? Pagan gods. We call them gods uh, because I guess the people call them gods. We don't think they're really gods. What was attractive about those pagan gods? Did they ever see any proof that the pagan gods were really doing something for them? I mean, we know that those pagan gods are made out of what? Stone or metal or wood. I mean, they have no power to do anything. So... Well, if the seasons went smoothly, you know, the rains came and then they went away and the harvest came and coincidentally they were sacrificing to those gods, then yeah. they might have some sense of confirmation. But Thought that, that they were doing something, huh? Well, weren't the, the uh, third of the, what we find out about at the end of the, in Revelation 12, the third of the angels they were involved in what was going on down here. So yeah. you've got Psalms 82 that supports that position. Yeah. And uh, then uh, Deuteronomy 32. Well it's, well, it's only fair to ask ourselves a question or two. What evidence do we have that God is really for us, loves us, and is willing to work with us? Well, the cross is... Okay. Uh, that's a historical a fact. Yeah, okay. and we can see him, you know, if we pay attention, we can see him at work in our lives, yeah. uh, maybe protecting us or opening doors and for us. And our atheist or friends would say that's just pure chance. Well, of course, that's the, ration, uh, that's the rationalization, mm-hmm. those sorts of things. Well, the, those pagan gods had two main things that attracted people, alcohol and sex. Yes, and, and Israel fell for both. Yes. And we're still following, following for them. Too. Well, and, and look at, today we have 
our modern addiction to professional sports, television, and movies. What do you think that's about? Alcohol and sex. And the well, times, the, the sports, you know, uh, you know they're advertised sure. w by uh, at least beer anyway. They don't. Great quantities. Right, and television and movies uh, insert uh, things about sex mm -hmm. in People order to are, draw attention. People are attracted to fantasies. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're, you've got Disneyland, you've got all these, uh, uh, and musics, and then you've got the computer-generated movies. Uh, people are just, uh, I don't know if it's escape, because they don't want to deal with reality, or they just like uh, to be amused. Yeah. Amusing themselves to death, I think. Wasn't there somebody who wrote, 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 wrote a book about like that? that. Yeah. It talked yeah. about that kid just graduated medical school, Loma Linda, and uh, my friend's uh, son and um, he was playing video games up to three o'clock in the morning oh bro. brilliant kid brilliant kid dad says no you need to stop this go to med school he did it <laughs> graduated from year three <laughs> you know but, so the talents are there you see but how satan yeah, how many of these are this kid it's just so many are vanishing away the lord has given tremendous amount of talents to these kids how do we use it yeah well, in ancient times, there was no stock market. There was some no sort of fancy way to get ahead. So what, the way you got ahead was you forced other people to work for you. And the more people you could force to work for you, the better chance you had to get ahead. And sometimes it was slavery. Sometimes it was employment. But at the end result was that the poor, the needy, the widow, the orphan, and the helpless were abused. That does not suggest that those sins were worse than worshiping idols or practicing false religions. However, we must not forget the less fortunate in our society today. In our complicated government systems of today, however, there's a problem. Almost every, theoretically at least, almost every difficult situation is addressed by some kind of a government program. So that means we can sit back and fold our arms and relax, right? Well, Nothing for us to do. That's the temptation. <laughs> that's the um, temptation. So, what? But there's always things in the cracks. There are always people who, who don't know about the government problems. Just mm -hmm. to take it from that level. First of all, trying to get people the help that they need. They they don't always know mm -hmm. what's available. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, making them aware, and then. Things yeah. that are just incidental kinds of stuff. I work with an organization that takes provides health care for low income or no income people, and we have to have a whole cadre of people that okay, we need to help you find housing. We need to help you get your medicines. We need to here's a, here's this we can get you either very low cost medicines or we can get you free medicines. I mean, we have a whole group of people just trying to do those kinds of things. Well, there's no question about the fact that God had a good plan for Israel back in the beginning. And, of course, they didn't follow it. They rarely lived up to what God wanted them to do. One of those, very quickly, if I could insert, yeah. is that every so many years, the, I think seven years or so, yeah. the servants could go, slaves could go free. Wow. Every seven years, don't plow the land. Yeah. Beautiful setup. They every so many years return the land that you have bought from. What is the setup? Yeah, exactly. One of the clearest times when they r went way away from God's plan was when when the prophet Samuel was getting older, and his two sons were absolute scoundrels, absolutely terrible people. They came to him and they said, "Give us a king. We want to be like other nations." So now I'm going to ask you all a question. Do you think they came to Samuel and asked that because they were really concerned about Samuel's sons or did they really just want a king and Samuel's sons were a good excuse? Well, they could both be sources of, you know, just the perfect storm, both yeah. coming together. Yeah. What's going to happen with Samuel gone? Yeah. Sons? Um, or they had been mulling over the idea of a king for some time and then it's just coming to a head here. Yeah. And when when they started talking like that, what did Samuel do? Do you remember? First Samuel eight, ten to eighteen, we don't have to read the whole thing, but he, he said, Look, if we appoint a king, 
He's going to ask your sons to work for him. He's going to ask your daughters to work for him. He's going to need all sorts of stuff. He needs people in his army. He needs da 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 etc. Are you willing to do that? Oh, yes, just give us a king. And what kind of king did they want? They wanted a tall, powerful, good-looking, strong guy who looks like a leader, right? <clears throat> now, I want to ask you another question. For those of, under, of us who understand the great controversy setting, um, we know from Revelation 4 and 5 that God's throne is in heaven, and surrounding that throne is our four living creatures, and surrounding that are 24 okay. elders seated on other thrones, and surrounding that there's hundreds of millions of angels. I want, to, I want you to ask yourself, what were those people thinking as they listening to the people say to Samuel, please, we want a king? What were the angels thinking when they heard that? They were rejecting God. Yeah. And we know what happened. I mean, Samuel, of course, Saul started out and he was a disaster. Even David and Solomon, as, as good as they were at times in their lives, they were corrupted by all that power and all those riches and so forth. So, how would that apply to us? Well, how much time do we spend keeping up with the Joneses, if you remember that particular expression? <laughs> Uh, how, how much are we influenced by our society? How much are we influenced by God's will for our lives? Do we care more about what the neighbors will think or more about what God will think? And how much time do we actually spend reaching out to the poor and needy around us? Should we do this? Is it our job to reach out to the poor and needy as individuals or should this be done as a church group? What do you think? Both. Both. That's the right answer, sure. <laughs> yeah, because there are times when, when we can reach out to individuals and it just needs an individual's touch. And there are other times when the church... Now, our church is a very large church, as you know, and we help run a pantry where we feed probably a thousand people every week, maybe more. Um, it's located down next to the place where I work. Well, as we've already mentioned, God's most important way of reaching out to the people in the Old Testament times was through the prophets. I want you to think about the situation, you know. Here were the kings. They were supposed to be the political and, and civil leaders. And here were the priests. They were supposed to be the religious leaders, right? And there were plenty of them. A whole tribe full of priests and, and kings and all sorts of people behind them and so forth. And all of a sudden, here's an outlier, a prophet. Why would you choose to listen to the outlier as opposed to the kings or the prophet, I mean, the, the priests? Depends on, uh, what? Well, depends on your heart. Okay. Is there a resonance in your heart with the things that are being said, or, or do you, is your will so bent that it resists when and God speaks through someone? As we're going to see in a little bit, uh, Isaiah started out. He stood up, he said, up by the temple, he says, You leaders of Sodom and Gomorrah. Does that sound like a good way to start off? <laughs> well. Get their attention. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure it would get their attention. Well, modern Jewish leaders such as Abraham, Joshua, Heschel have reflected on those urgent calls for justice through the ancient prophets. And these are his words. Jackie, I think you have something on that. The things that horrified the prophets are even now daily occurrences all over the world. Their breathless impatience with injustice may strike us as hysteria. We ourselves witness continually acts of injustice, manifestations of hypocrisy, falsehood, outrage, misery. But we rarely grow indignant or overly excited. To the prophets, even a minor injustice injustice assumes cosmic proportions. Wow. Mm. So in other words, injustice was a big deal. And they spoke about it very openly. So how would you, 
think about what you know of the minor prophets now. Just think about the minor prophets. How would you describe their words? I mean, do you really look at those words and say, these are the words of God? Do they sound like the words of God? Some of them are pretty harsh, aren't they? Well, I think Ellen White says it's the <coughs> thoughts that are inspired. It's not necessarily God's words unless it's, of course, God speaking. But, yeah. but the thoughts, and so the expressions are the expressions of man. Mm -hmm. So they may, uh, so sometimes they may use hyperbole that, um, well, I don't know. Anyway, it's, it, it, it'll sound different through different uh, vessels. So, I mean, then we have to ask ourselves that question. How much of what they said was influenced by their society? Mm. That's a serious thing we need to think about. And how much was directly God-given? We have sometimes they quoted God just specifically, and so we can be pretty sure about that. Yes, Jim? Uh, I like what, uh, when here Jeremiah 7. Verse 16, As for you, do not pray for this people, or lift up cry or prayer for them, and do not intercede with me, for the, I do not hear you. Do you not see what they are doing in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? And so on and so yeah, forth. Yeah. I mean, at, at other places, it says, I don't want any more of your noisy hymns. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, uh, well, well the, I, I, to me, the question is, um, is the message... Um, is the situation in the society, mm -hmm. is it God reacting to this or is it just the prophet? Yeah, and that would be the question we have and, to ask. And so, uh, you know, and, and the scripture is human and divine, and the more liberal a person is, the more human they try to make it and more. Okay, well now, so I'm going to, you know what's going to come next? How much are we influenced by our society around us? as opposed to what we know from the Word of God. Depends on how much time we meditate on. Do we, do we ever want to be like the other nations? Of course, we usually just say, keeping up with the Joneses, that sounds better than like the other nations, isn't it? Amos had some words, and what do we know about him, Dennis? Uh, this is from the SDA Bible Dictionary, Siegfried Horn writing. Amos bore his message while Jeroboam II was king of Israel and Uzzah was king of Judah. The fact that these two monarchs reigned concurrently, each as sole ruler of his realm, only between uh, about 767 and 530, uh, 753 B.C. probably limits Amos's ministry, prophetic ministry to this brief period. And uh, 760 may therefore be taken as an approximate date for this book. Okay. So and, that gives us a, at least a little clue about what time period. We may not know much about it. What it, Some words that Amos spoke? This is Amos seven fourteen to 15. Amos answered, I am not the kind of prophet who prophesies for pay. I am a herdsman and I take care of fig trees. But the Lord took me from my work as a shepherd and ordered me to come and <coughs> prophesy to this people, Israel. That's wow. from the Good News uh, translation of the Bible. Let's talk about what Amos' story is a little bit. Amos came from an area down next to Philistia, almost a, lived almost among the Philistines. But as the season would get hot toward the end of the summer, he would move up to the higher territory and to places where people were growing figs. And this particular kind of sycamore fig, unless you puncture the fig itself, and, and I don't know exactly what it does, but you have to make a hole in the fig, otherwise it, otherwise it doesn't ripen. Mm -hmm. So there's a little wasp that does that naturally. If you have plenty of those wasps around, you're fine. But if you don't have enough of those wasps around, you have to have somebody come and actually poke a little hole. So it turns out this was a good arrangement because under these huge, big spreading trees, there was still grass growing. So Amos could bring his sheep and his goats probably under the tree and they could eat while he's up in the tree poking holes in the fig. <coughs> and, the, and the fig owners would pay him to, to, to this to their figs. And meanwhile, or in exchange perhaps for a place to, uh, to let his... 
his his sheep and his goats uh, uh, do. So, um, Dale, I think you've got something on that. The prophet Amos refers to his secondary occupation as a dresser or a tender of sycamores. Amos 7.14. This involved slashing the fruits to induce ripening. Yeah. Okay. Amos was a herder of sheep. But when the dry times of the year came around, it was hard to, for the pasture, for, to find pasture for the sheep. There were farmers not too far away who had orchards and sycamore fig trees. These widespreading shady trees provided a place where grass continued to grow and the sheep could feed. At the same time, this particular type of fig required a small slit to be made in it before it could be ripened, as we've already mentioned. Amos was very open to admitting. Now, he was called from, that's a southern part of, of Judah, is where he lived. But he was called to the northern kingdom of Israel to, to prophesy. He was very open to admitting he was not a trained prophet. So now I'm going to ask you another question. A question that I'm not sure I know the answer to. Maybe you have some insight. Were the schools of the prophets still functioning in Amos' day? How would we know? Who, who, who do we know that, that sort of started the schools of the prophets? Samuel, Samuel started the schools oh, of prophets. Yeah, exactly. And who was the one who built them up a little while later? Elijah. Elijah and <coughs> Elijah, especially Elijah, but then Elisha carried on. So, so the three people that we know that were really involved with the schools of prophets were Samuel and then later Elijah and Elisha. And those schools of prophets were Elijah and Elisha ministered to people in the northern kingdom of Israel, not in the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, I, it's possible that some young people from young men, women who weren't going to school in those days, young men actually traveled up to the northern part and, and attended some of the schools. We just don't know. But we don't know whether or not any of them were still functioning in Amos' day or not. We just don't know. But it sounds like, well, of course, do we know about any other prophets that got paid to do their work? Think about it carefully. Well, the... The false prophets, probably. Okay, sure. <laughs> All the false prophets, they got paid for doing what... I mean, look at Jezebel. She had 850 of them that she was paying to try to spread her terrible news. I was going to call it good news, but it's not good news. <laughs> or a terrible word. So Amos in his message, he starts out saying, look at the terrible deeds of Syria and Philistia and Phoenicia and Edom and Ammon and Moab. And he talked about their crimes of, and their sins of, uh, of, of uh, ter ter terrible things they were doing often against God's people. Then Amos comes next, moved a little closer to his audience. You could just see him sort of going around, circling the camp, <laughs> circling the camp, getting closer and closer. He moved to talk a little bit more. He talked about the people from the southern kingdom of Judah. No doubt his audiences were happy to hear about God's judgments against their neighbors and enemies. But then Amos turned on his audience. And if we had time, we would read you. Amos 3, 9 through 11, and 4, 1 and 2. I will just read that one. Look at Amos 4, 1, 2. Listen to this, you women of Samaria who grow fat like the well-fed cows of Bashan, who ill-treat the weak, oppress the poor, and demand that your husbands keep you supplied with liquor. Whoa. How does that sound? Is that a good thing? These passages point out that many of their sins involve crimes of violence, dishonesty, as well as abuse of the weak, the poor, widows and orphans. He even mentioned uh, the mans of women, as we already mentioned there. Um, let's look at Amos 5, 10 to 15. You people hate one another who hate anyone who challenges injustice and speaks the whole truth in court. You hate them. You have oppressed the poor and robbed them of their grain. And so you will not live in the fine stone houses you build or drink wine from the beautiful vineyards you plant. I know how terrible your sins are and how many crimes you have committed. You persecute good people, take bribes, and prevent the poor from getting justice in the courts. And so keeping quiet at such evil times is a clever thing to do. Make it your aim to do what is right, not what is evil, so that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty really will be with you as you claim he is. Hate what is evil, love what is right, and see that justice prevails in the courts. Perhaps the Lord will be merciful to the people of this nation who are still left alive. How would we uh, feel if someone giving a message like that standing outside the Supreme Court in Washington? Hmm. 
Well, Amos, like other prophets in the Old Testament, after giving their powerful messages against their audience, Amos ended with some encouraging words from God. In their... Uh, I'm sorry. That would be Charles. Yes. In their hour of deepest apostasy and greatest need, God's message to them was one of forgiveness and hope. Ellen G. White, Prophets and Kings, page 283, paragraph 1. Okay. Well... Okay, let's be honest now, folks. Are there times when we need to speak up? Yes. Maybe about things that are going on in the church? Mm -hmm. Or things that are going on in the government? Are we ever called upon to do that? Or are we supposed to be quiet and keep our peace? I think I would speak up only in my own sphere of influence. In, in my own? neighborhood, in my home, in my... But what if the yeah. problems that you need to speak about are in Washington, D.C. or Tacoma Park or someplace like that? God would have to tell Dennis first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or write a letter or, or a blog or something. Well, or I could call my cousin. He's got a position back there. So. I see. <laughs> well, in our day, so many of these issues are controlled by government. And I don't know how it strikes you, but boy, I see things. I just read, and I was on the on one of the news items on, on the Internet that just blew me away that they are now recording, or they have the capacity to record. I can't see if they're recording <coughs> yet, but the capacity to record. If you've got a new car, everywhere you go, where you go to eat, where you, how much time you spend in each place, uh, what kind of things you're likely to buy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They're going to know everything about you just by recording what you do in your car. There will be no place to hide. Wow. Jim, tell me about Micah. A comparison of Micah 1.1 with Isaiah 1.1 and 6.1 and Hosea 1.1 reveals that Micah's prophetic ministry began shortly after those of Isaiah and Hosea, and that for a number of years he was a contemporary he was contemporary with them. Micah's ministry thus fell between about seven thirty nine and six eighty six BC, probably during the earlier portion of this period. Okay. So that would be during the time that the northern kingdom of Israel when were they conquered by the Assyrians after a three-year siege. Do you remember? All you historians. 723-722 B.C. They were finally conquered and scattered to the winds by the Assyrians. Well, these passages clearly point out that there were several prophets prophesying at the same time. And it's interesting to notice that if you look through the Old Testament, when there were times of crisis... When there are times of crisis, something really monumental is happening, there's more prophets active. When the country of Judah was later about to go into Babylonian captivity, there were seven prophets prophesying at the same time, including, Jackie, one lady. Had a very prominent position. So, there we go. So, some in the northern kingdom, some in the southern kingdom... They were busy during the reigns of Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. During the three-year siege of Samaria, I'm sorry, yeah, this, I guess this is mine. During the three-year siege of Samaria, capital of Israel, by the Assyrians, Shalmaneser V died and was succeeded by Sargon II of Assyria, who himself records the capture of that city thus, quoting from extra-biblical sources that are placards and things that are available in the museums, Samaria I looked at, I captured. 27,280 men who dwelt in it, I carried away into Assyria. Mm. Wow. Okay. Who was that prominent lady? Hulda. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the king, when he wanted advice, he sent his people to Hulda to get advice from her. Yeah. You, you read about it. Well, anyway, you read about it in Second Chronicles. 
Well, the famous passage that really deals with this issue is found in Micah 6, 68. And I'm going to read that. What shall I bring to the Lord, the God of heaven, when I come to worship him? Shall I bring the best calves to burn his offerings to him? Will the Lord be pleased if I bring him thousands of sheep or endless streams of olive oil? I mean, think about that. Thousands of sheep and endless streams of olive oil. Shall I offer him my firstborn child to pay for my sins? Can you imagine that? <clears throat> no, the Lord has told us what is good. What he requires of us is this, to do what is just, to show constant love, and to live in humble fellowship with our God. Wow. So that's what is more important than thousands of sheep and endless streams of olive oil? Do justice, oh, love, mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Exactly. James wow. Yep. So how can we today what is do what is right, show constant love, and live in humble fellowship with our God? Is that something easy to spell out in our day? It's a choice. Mm -hmm. And it's easy. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, in order to understand the context in which Micah sta uh, stated these principles, we need to read Micah 2, 8 through 11. And I'm going to read that really quick. The Lord replies, You attack my people like enemies. Men return from battle thinking they are safe at home, but they're, there you are, watching to steal the coats off their backs. You drive the women of my people out of their homes, out of the homes they love, and you have robbed their children of my blessings forever. Get up and go. There is no safety here anymore. Your sins have doomed this place to destruction. These people want the kind of prophet who goes about full of lies and deceit and says, I prophesy that wine and liquor will flow for you. Hmm. Is that the kind of prophet we need today? <laughs> Imagine that. They want it. it was a time when the city's rulers governed for, for bribes. The priests interpreted the law for pay. The prophets gave the revelations for money, and they all claimed that the Lord was with them. How would we how would we survive in a society like that? The law, the priests interpreted the law for pay, the city's rulers governed for bribes, the prophets gave their revelations for money. No harm will come to us, they say. The Lord is with us. It was during those days when Ahaz was king of Judah that the children of Israel fell to a new low in the history of their nation. Idolatry and all kinds of evil practices were common, and once again, people preyed on the poor, the helpless, the widow, and the orphan. In his small book, Micah started out expressing God's anger and sorrow at the evil people were doing. But God was not done with them yet. By the time Micah reached the end of his book in Micah 7, 8, 18-22, God told Micah that he would trample their sins underfoot and send their sins to the bottom of the sea. Now, how do you put those together? I mean, one moment he says, you know, you're doing all these terrible things and people are bribing and all that kind of stuff. And then he's, God says, well, but I'll take your sins and I'll throw them in the bottom of the sea. If, if you turn to me. Yes. That's the if. The message has always been the same. You see, when Jesus came, it's the same story. Just before him, John the Baptist, same story. Okay, what would we, what would we say today if, uh, or what would they say today if God sent an Amos or a Hosea to us? Anybody? They think they'd have something pretty serious to say to us? I'm sure. Or Micah? Hmm? I'm sure they would. What is the link between, and we, well, we'll talk about that a little bit later. What is the link between justice, loving mercy, and calmly walking humbly before our God? Well, Ezekiel. Really what that means is a willingness to listen mm -hmm. and to take instruction from the one who knows the future. He knows how things work. Ezekiel, a priest, the son of Buzi, born in Judah but transported to Babylonia with a group that went into captivity with Jehoiachin in 597 B.C. He read about that in Ezekiel 1, 1 to 3. He was then about 25 years of age if the 30th year, which he mentions in chapter 1, 1, is a reference to his own age, which probably it is. So in the fifth year of his captivity, he was called to the prophetic office, so therefore he was taken captive. At, uh, at the age of 25 and served in this capacity for some 22 years from about 593 to 571. And I'll say just a couple words about that before we move on. 
incredible as it may seem, there were actually people in the Old Testament times who recorded uh, solar things that happened, solar eclipses and lunar eclipses and so forth, and told exactly which day it happened on. So we can go back and we can nail down often to the, at least to, easily to the year, sometimes to the month, sometimes even to the very day when some of these things happened because of, of the way they, how carefully they spelled those things out. Well, Ezekiel prophesied mostly from the territory of Babylonia, as we know. He was taken into captivity with the people. He has some very strong words against the sins of the children of Israel, which had resulted in that being in captivity. Look at Ezekiel 16, 49. She and her daughters, talking about um, Judah, she and her daughters were proud because they had plenty to eat and lived in peace and quiet, but they did not take care of the poor and the underprivileged. They were proud and stubborn and did the things that I hate, so I destroyed them as you well know. Well, why do you think God chose to compare the people of Judah with the people of Sodom and Gomorrah? People, I'm sorry, of Sodom and Samaria? Given what we know from Genesis 19, and what's the story in Genesis 19? That's Lot. the story of Lot and so forth. We, must often think of se we most often think of sexual perversions when we think about the city of Sodom. We even have a, a name for that. <coughs> we call sodomy, don't we? But writing many years later, Ezekiel said that one of their biggest sins was abuse of the poor and needy. So why do you think Lot moved into the city, into the city of Sodom? He did not at first live in the city. Remember, he lived with Abraham until their two, both of them, their flocks got so large that they really couldn't stay together. So Abraham said, what? You choose. 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 Which side do you, where, where do you want to go? So Lot chose to go where? down in the valley. But he did not live at first in the city of Sodom. With his enormous flocks and herds, he lived in the fertile valley of the Jordan River, living in tents like his uncle Abraham. But there are hints that he married a wife from the city of Sodom. What do we know about his wife? Well, here's a comment from Ellen White. The wife of Lot was a selfish, irreligious woman, and her influence was exerted to separate her husband from Abraham. But for her, Lot would not have remained in Sodom, deprived of the counsel of the wise, God-fearing patriarch. The influence of his wife and the associations of that wicked city would have led him to apostatize from God had it not been for the faithful instruction he had early received from Abraham. So here we have Lot being torn. His wife says, go this way, and his instructions from Abraham say, go this way. The marriage of Lot and his choice of Sodom for home were the first links in a chain of events fraught with evil to the world for many generations. Patriarchs and Prophets, 174, paragraph 2. So that make it raise another question in my mind. How does Ezekiel know about Lot's sins and about the problems in Sodom? Ever asked yourself that question? History was handed down. History was handed down, and he was probably to explain some of it by God. Um, well, he and so he knew about considerable. Detail. They claimed they were, that th these people that he was living among were worse than the people of Sodom. Three right. many types of sin, and this mm -hmm. is one of the, the terrible things. In, in Jude, it in, singles in, out the sexual perversion yeah. things. Can you think of any other uh, people who railed against uh, cities that were supposed to be saints, where they were supposed to be saints, and compared them with Sodom and Gomorrah? All you biblical scholars? Let me read you a couple of passages, see if you can remember where this comes from. How terrible it will be for you, Chores, and how terrible for you too, Bethsaida, if the miracles which were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, the people there would long ago have put on sackcloth and sprinkled ashes on themselves to show that they had turned from their sins. I assure you that on the judgment day, God will show more mercy to the people of Tyre and Sidon than to you. And as for you, Capernaum, did you want to lift yourself up to heaven? You'll be thrown down to hell. If the miracles that which were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would still be in existence today. Hmm. Whose words are those? Jesus himself. Those are the words of Jesus. Let me read another one. Luke 10, 13 to 15. 
how terrible it would be for you chores and how terrible for you too, but say that if the miracles which were performed and so forth, basically it's a repetition of what we just read from Matthew. But so, before, just, just um, maybe not just before going to cross, he walked 200 miles to Sidon. And the great faith of that uh, son of Felicia and Oban. Mm-hmm. It's unbelievable. Yes. Well, the book of Ezekiel ends with many long-term prophetic messages about what could happen to the children of Israel if they would simply follow God's plan for their lives. And did they do that? Mm. Terrible. Well, God said, I will bring you back. I will look for the lost and hurting. I will help those who um, were sick and destroy those who claim to be strong. God promised to be a faithful shepherd. And he goes on, remember, that the describing in detail the kind of temple that was supposed to be built and, and divi- how the li- land was supposed to be redivided up to all the different tribes of Israel. I mean, this is why Judah is in, 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 in captivity and the northern tribes have already been scattered in Assyria. Did God know that, that this would never happen? Surely he must have... Um, Obviously, I believe in God's foreknowledge. He knew that this would never happen. So why would he give all those messages to Ezekiel? Well, to show what he could have done if they had listened to him. Yeah. What does it tell us about God's hopes for Israel? They may have fallen far away from his plan for them, but there was always, always, always God appealing to them, please come back. Please obey me. Please follow my directions. I can do so much for you if you'll just come back. Well, let me ask you a question. As Seventh-day Adventist Church, do we, should we be in the, we, we should have been in the kingdom of heaven before this, according to Ellen White. But God still loves us. Okay. Jackie, I think you've got something in Isaiah. <clears throat> Greatest of the Hebrew prophets and author of the book that bears his name, He was a son of Amoz and came to the prophetic office toward the close of the reign of Uzzah. That was 790. Let me just clarify just for a moment. You need to specify, this is not the Uzzah that was struck dead in David's day. This is Uzziah, the king. Ah, Uzziah, I see that. Don't get those two mixed up. (laughs) Go ahead. 790 to 739 B.C and served also under Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, 686. Tradition makes him cousin of Isaiah. According to tradition, Isaiah fell a martyr to Hezekiah's son, Manasseh, who abolished the reforms instituted by his father and presumably had the prophet sawn asunder. Okay, there's a, there's a record, probably a reliable record, about how... Isaiah, he, he, Isaiah was threatened. He went and tried to hide inside of a hollow tree. And the, this, the story says that a little part of his robe stuck out under the, the bottom. And, they, and so someone came along and saw it. There he is. And they just cut him in half. Well, look at Isaiah 1, 15 and following. When you lift your hands in prayer, this is God's message to Isaiah, his first sermon, the young prophet, first sermon. When you lift your hands in prayer, I will not look at you. No matter how much you pray, I will not listen for your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourselves clean. Stop all this evil that I see you doing. Yes, stop doing evil and learn to do right. See that justice is done. Help those who are oppressed. Give orphans their rights and defend widows. The Lord says, now let's settle the matter. You are stained red with sin but I'll wash you as clean as snow. Although your stains are deep red, you'll be as white as wool. Wow. Famous verse there at the end, huh? Mm. Try to imagine yourself with a young prophet giving your first sermon like that. He went on to talk about how God would not even listen to their prayers unless they turned back and obeyed him and did what was right. Is that true? I thought no matter how much, no matter what the situation, if we, call, if we pray to God, he hears us. What's all this about not even hearing our prayers? You know what hits me about that verse, though, is the young man you were talking about. That verse says, stop doing evil and learn to do good. That hints to 
it being easy to do evil. And you have to measure your steps and learn to walk in the ways that are right. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to point that out. So. Yeah, good point. Well, he described the leaders of Israel as rebels and friends of those who accepting bri gifts and bribes, never defending orf orphans in court or listening when widows presented their cases. I want you to try to imagine what it would be like to be a widow or an orphan under those circumstances. They plundered vineyards, filling their houses with what they had stolen from the poor. Hmm. Look at Isaiah 5, verses 7 and 8. Israel is the vineyard of the Lord Almighty. The people of Judah are the vines he planted. He expected them to do what was good, but instead they committed murder. He expected them to do what was right, but their victims cried out for justice. Wow. They even committed murder. The victims were constantly crying out. Isaiah made it very clear how serious their rejection of God had become. He is known as the gospel prophet for a lot of reasons, which we won't have, don't have time to go into right now. He mourned about the terrible conditions existing in his day in the country of Judah. There's quite a bit of discussion at the end of this lesson about Isaiah 58. We don't have time to look at that. And 59 it goes on, but especially chapter 58. There's a loud cry for justice. He stated clear that justice is driven back and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth is trampled in the streets and honesty cannot enter. Do we have any of those kinds of conditions in our world today? Do you think God's promises to them would still be valid today? If we come back to him, he will bless us and Amen. take care of us. Well, in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, 11, 1 to 5, 42, 1 to 7, and 53, 4 to 6, we read about famous prophecies that, uh, well, these are very famous prophecies about the Messiah, uh, the true descendant of David who would bring justice to the universe. And Isaiah 53 is very often quoted as being perhaps the best prophecy in the Old Testament regarding the life of Jesus. So why do you suppose that right in the middle of that prophecy it says, all the while we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God? Isaiah 53, 4. Do you know of any Christians today that teach that Jesus died under the retributive justice sent by God? Yes. Permeates most theology in one way or another. Yep. So God is angry at sin and he has to get his two bits of flesh in. So, uh, uh, he has to get it back and so Jesus goes and he dies on our behalf and God says, well, okay, Whew, my anger is assuaged now so it's okay, right? That's, a, that's has, a pagan understanding of God and yeah. uh, people have, have been rooted in that for millennia. Yeah. Well, I see myself um, on the path of sin going to fall off a cliff and die mm -hmm. because no one can survive without God mm -hmm. so he keeps putting stumbling blocks in my way mm -hmm. he tells me and warns me I can see you Jackie what are you doing mm -hmm. and he will do anything yeah. and if somebody is praying for me there's going to be more stumbling steps to wake me up so that I can be happy and saved and walking in right steps. I see it a uh, totally loving God mm -hmm. trying to warn these folks. Mm -hmm. But he, the, one of the problems is God cannot violate your freedom to Exactly. Choose. And so uh, you, ultimately if you choose to reject truth all I God, we it. got Romans 1, mm -hmm. the wrath of God is gives but you up, lets you, have, you go. Yeah. If you have your lesson quarterly available, here's Bible study guide. Look at Prophets and Kings, page 282, first paragraph, verses, uh, uh, pages 306 and 307 and 327. They're quoted there in, 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 the Bible, in your Bible study guide. Some very strong words. If you mention prophecy or a prophet to a Christian in our day, he usually thinks of someone who foretells the future. But as we have noted in this lesson, much of a prophet's work was crying out against the abuses going on in their own society. Mm -hmm. And guess who did the same kind of thing? Ellen White also prophesied in that same manner. Only a small part of what she said or wrote was not the form of predicting the future. By far, the majority of what she wrote was about correcting our errors and instructing us in righteousness. 
But prophesying in this manner can be a dangerous undertaking. Isaiah was sawn in half by Manasseh for his statements against that wicked king. Ellen White was sent to Australia to get her out of the way. Who did it? I wonder who did that. <laughs> what she wrote from Australia was some of the most powerful material of her entire lifetime and also some of the most damning of the church's leadership. If you want to check that out, read First Selected Messages 233 to 235. In all of these writings, we have noticed that God, through his prophets, alternates between damning condemnations and deep loving concern for his people. How can those two go together? Doesn't that seem like a contradiction? I mean, this is the this is a true picture of someone who really loves somebody and he sees them, like you just said, Jackie, going in the wrong direction. What do you do? You say, please don't, 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 come back. Well, I love you. I, I, I really want to help you. But please don't. <laughs> you know, it's back and forth. You know, this is what God was doing. So try to imagine yourself living and acting as one of these Old Testament prophets. Can you imagine what that was like? How do you think you would survive? Would you dare to speak out as they did? What are we doing today to call our church and ourselves back to God's ideal for our lives? Are we really preparing a people for the second coming of Jesus Christ? It is clear that those Old Testament prophets saw themselves as watchmen on the walls of Zion. And what do we say, what do we say is our job? Aren't we supposed to be watchmen on the walls of Zion? Trying to warn people about the dangers ahead? Do we have a similar responsibility today? Look at a couple of verses. Mortal man, said Ezekiel, I am making you a wa uh, God, said God to Ezekiel, I am making you a watchman for the nation of Israel. You will pass on to them the warnings I give you. If I announce that an evil person is going to die, but you do not warn him to change his ways so that he can save his life, he will die still a sinner, and I will hold you responsible for his death because you didn't warn him. If you do, no, do warn an evil man and he doesn't stop sinning, he will die, still a sinner, but your life will be spared. What do you think God would say that to us today? Well, Dennis, I think you have some words about that. All right. This is from the Adult uh, Teacher Sabbath School uh, Bible Study Guide, page 65. The shepherd prophet Amos, who calls his people to justice and righteousness... And two, Micah, whose message to Ahaz is given during a time when the kingdom reaches an all-time low in justice. Three, Ezekiel, who speaks to the exiles in Babylon. And four, Isaiah, who calls God's people to live out the messianic hope for a just nation. Uh, where are the voices calling for justice and mercy today? Well, I mean, we have just barely touched these four prophets, and there's lots of others we haven't mentioned at all. And yet, wouldn't messages like that be appropriate in our day? Aren't there sins and problems that need to be pointed out? Do we have any Amos's, Micah's, Ezekiel's, or Isaiah's in our church today? While these prophets were called out to governments, were calling out to governments and peoples who at least claim to be the people of God. I mean, how, what percentage of people in our world today even claim to be God's people? Well, in the history of the United States of America, probably the greatest injustice was the period of slavery. Ellen White took a significant role in the church's action toward the black work, as it was called. Her son and daughter-in-law worked there for many years. She sent a very strong message to the General Conference meeting in Battle Creek, Michigan in 1892, telling them that they must not any longer neglect the black work. She knew that this would lead us and bring her into conflict with some of the church leadership. She did not look forward to that conflict, but she refused to live as a coward. Are we living as cowards today by not speaking about social injustice? It is clear from this lesson that God's love is other-directed. That is, God is asking us constantly to reach out to those who are in most need. What are we doing to accomplish that? Well, compare the following passage. Here's a comment from our former General Conference President. Dale? There's a vast difference between seeking a voice in the public discourse and seeking to wield political power. As a church and individuals, 
we have not only the right, but the obligation to be a moral voice in society, to speak clearly and eloquently on that which touches our values. Human rights, religious freedom, public health, poverty, and injustice, these are some of the areas in which we have a God-given responsibility to advocate for those who cannot speak for themselves. Wow. Very good. And again, passages mentioned here. If you want to get our handout, it's available online. Go to theox.org. That's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. And there's Amos 5, Isaiah 61, Jeremiah 9, Micah 6, 1 Samuel 15. It just goes on and on. God had done everything he could to try to lead his people in the right direction. We know what happened. Well, Ellen White also had some very strong things to say. Often we suggest that the worst sins are sins of commission. But what about sins of omission? Are there things that we are supposed to be doing that we're not doing? Think about James 4, 7, Matthew 25, 41 to 40, 31 to 46. I'm sorry, there's a misprint there. In conclusion, read the following words from Ellen White. Yes, there is a cause for the moral paralysis upon the society. Our laws sustain the evil which is sapping their very foundations. Many deplore the wrongs which they know exist, but consider themselves free from all responsibility in the matter. This cannot be. Every individual exists, exerts an influence in the society. In our favored land, every voter has some voice in determining what laws shall control the nation. Should not that influence and that vote be cast on the side of temperance and virtue? Ellen G. White, Riven Herald, November 8, 1881. She wrote those words just a couple of, were a couple months after her husband passed away mm-hmm. in August of 1881. As a church, we have tended to focus on the second coming of Jesus and our charge to prepare the world for that event. But are we doing, what are we doing about the social injustices affecting those around us? What should be the relationship between our preparing the world for the second coming of Jesus and our dealing with the many evils and social injustices in the world around us? If we reach out to the poor and the needy, if we try to justify, I mean, all the injustices that are happening, wouldn't that prepare people for the second coming? I ask you. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you so much for being with us through this discussion, helping us to talk a little bit about these fantastic expressions from the Old Testament times. Help us to have greater respect for Amos and Hosea and Micah and Isaiah and others that spoke just as strongly in the Old Testament. May we come to be like them with the courage that they had, speaking out is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.